it's the roots that make the difference. If I have a really good fibrous root system, uh, that tree will grow faster than the tree next to it. And, uh, and it's, there's no contest. It, and and I, don't know, I don't know that we can breed for this. I think the only way we can do it is mechanically uh, root prune these things so that they will perform accordingly. Here's a root bag in the ground. I'm a little leery of the, uh, the trunk. It, I don't see the flare that I'd like to see, uh, which is a problem. But here's the kind of roots we like to see coming out of a root bag. And that's the kind of roots. Now, people will tell me time and time again, you know, well, if you see that many roots, is that a good tree, a bad tree? What are, you, what are you looking at? The best trees that we pull out will have the best roots. Now, the question always arises is, how far do those roots go in the first year? This is downtown Nebraska. We had some trees planted in some tree guards, and, uh, and they, um, they uh, had some hooligans. I have other names for them, but hooligans is good enough. Come along and put a chain on this and then jerk the whole thing out of the ground. Now, these trees were planted, and this was done, uh, I think they were, planted, they were planted in the fall. This was done the following spring, and you get an idea. Now, some of the roots obviously broke off, but that's the kind of root growth that you can expect on trees planted. In other words, we've got three feet of root on some of those plants already, and it's only been six months, and part of that's winter. So that sort of gives you an idea how fast these things can grow. And it's critical for us to have that happen because as fast as those grow, the quicker that plant responds and the faster it recovers from transplant, which is the most serious problem, in my humble opinion, in establishment is to get these plants to make it happen. Some people say, well, how big a tree can you grow? Well, you can grow uh, trees of this size and that container, by the way, has holes in it, and the roots grow into those holes, and they root prune themselves. And then if you want to continue growing that plant, you move the container out another section of four inches and continue to get it bigger and bigger. Of course, this is done down south. It isn't done up here. If we did that, most of our trees would be dead the next spring, so we have to mulch them or take care of them in other fashions so they don't have the freezing and thawing that they don't have further south. On the other hand, uh, we did do that. It's a five inch uh, 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 black walnut that we brought up from the field and it was 18 inch bag and we put in a 36 inch uh, container with those same kind of, of uh, root pruning techniques and um, the, one of the past senators of Indiana liked walnuts so it got sent to Indianapolis that total ball weighed about 200 pounds. So it's a five inch tree and a 200 pound ball. And the tree is doing extremely well as we speak. And it's been a several years. So we have the potential to actually increase uh, or get large sizes of trees in these things and have them survive extremely well. Here's an idea of what you see when you put a small pot into a bigger pot into a bigger pot. You see the continual proliferation of roots. Some people might say that the roots are too much and what happens when they cross over. There's really not an issue on roots crossing over. They'll actually graft on themselves as long as it's root on root. The issue becomes is when it goes across the bottom of where the root flare is and we have what we call a strangling of the tree. But in the root system, they doesn't, it doesn't really mean anything and they'll graft onto each other. Also, a number of these roots will not make it out of this thing a proportion, a large proportion of them do, but some of them obviously die off. Again, at that root structure where the plant was cut, you can see the dramatic increase in new roots. This is right at that four inch rule. This is where it happens. Got two trees here, one ball and burlap and one in a fabric bag that uh, looks like Velcro on the inside. And as the roots hit that Velcro, it uh, stops them from circling and then they start new roots. The one on the left is a ball and burlap tree and unfortunately it uh, was planted a little too deep which is a problem still in the nursery industry. I just got done the other day at a client's house. We had to dig down 10 to 12 inches just to get to where the root flare was and that was in the original ball. So this problem has not gone away. This problem is still definitely out there. And believe me, when you plant a tree too deep in our soils, that's a one-way ticket. 
Now, these two trees then are uncovered. And that's the difference. I'm not saying that everybody has trees like that on the left, but you know, one of the things you can do when you've got a tree, a uh, bald and burlap, if you grab the tree by the trunk, which they tell you not to do, but grab it by the trunk and shake it to see what's moving, and the tree moves and the ball doesn't, then go to the next tree, because that plant does not have good roots. So. We have options now to, instead of bringing in trees in ball and burlap, we can actually grow trees in containers that will actually not have circling and be a lot less in weight and the plants will recover that much quicker. The, uh, this right here is a three and a half inch uh, swamp white oak. It's approximately, the ball was 75 pounds and uh, we planted it the first year, it sort of sat there, by the second year it was off and running. So this potential is out there, when, and I do believe in the future, as we go forward, you're going to see more and more container trees. My hope is, however, that they take containers that are suitable to make sure that those roots get pruned and don't circle. This is to say, however, that I cannot solve all the world's problems. If you put a large tree in a small ball in a crap hole, you get a crap tree. You know, and there's nothing I can do about that. And so there's, there's choices to be made here, and this is not one of them. You can also take trees and put them too deep into the ground, both at the nursery and in the landscape. Humans, for whatever reason, dig deep holes. We don't know why, and we're not sure who they're burying. <laughs> but anyways... This happens on a regular basis. And unfortunately, it is up to you to find that root flare and make sure that that is one to two inches above grade. Now, if you find a root flare and you're planting in wet, wet ground, you better bring it up six or eight inches. And the reason for that twofold is even if the plant is a swamp plant, so to speak, quote unquote, the plant has been planted in a situation in the nursery where we try to avoid swamps at all costs. We like to get out there once in a while and sell plants and swamp, swamp walking is not really one of our chores. And so you want to elevate that tree if it's in a standing water situation, six to eight inches above that standing water and then flare it out. Most wetland plants, for example, over here in the Indiana where we were just here the other day, um, they uh, have swamp white oak that grows in Skunk cabbage. Everybody know what skunk cabbage is? That's a spectacular plant to say the least. It smells bad, but man, talk about green leaves and beautiful. And then it actually generates its own heat in, in, the, in the springtime, enough to generate heat that actually brings in either beetles or flies. So it's a unique area, but skunk cabbage lives in water. And those swamp white oak, when you look at them, are basically six inches above that water level where they've been established. But if it's 100 foot swamp whites, which is what these are, they're obviously out there three, 400 feet. So they're actually in the swamp, but they do need some air around those roots initially to keep it alive. So you do have to elevate wet plants, particularly when they come from a nursery that is not necessarily a wet situation. There's your telephone pole going into the ground. And then they actually put more soil around it. It's a, it's always enjoyable to watch these solutions to landscape problems. And if you actually look, this one already has a flat side on it, so we actually got girdling root at the bottom in there. Here's a swamp white that had a unique system of getting out of the compacted soil. Compacted soil is a major problem. He just got on top and ran for a berm which is sitting down here. I wish I could have got the picture of the berm, but there's about a four foot berm and that root just goes across the ground and disappears into the berm. It's almost like it ran out there. So, you know, some trees are more creative than others and have the ability to adapt. Here's, a, here's what we call a, a root girdling. Uh, when that root goes around the root flare, it'll girdle the tree and if it's flat on that side, uh, it has got a girdling root even if you can't see it. So we, and we see a tremendous number of girdling root. I still don't fully understand the premise of why we have girdling roots, but I do understand the function 
the cells of that root flare are different from the cells of the root. So when they come together, they're incompatible. And because they're incompatible, they'll girdle it. If a root on root came together, they are compatible and they will graft. But in this case, they won't. The other thing that blew me away was that the, that's burlap down there. I don't know how old that tree is, but that was part of the burlap tree. And it must have been treated with copper because it's still there and that tree's quite large. So uh, an amazing, uh, amazing feat in uh, human ingenuity. Uh, bottom line is that tree is pretty much doomed. You can go in there with an ax and cut it, but it'd probably be better to cut the tree than the root because it doesn't seem to survive even after you cut the roots unless they're small and you have the ability. I very seldom see this kind of problem in the woods where we do a lot of our hiking and the like or in natural areas. It's basically a, a problem that is conducive to trees being planted out in the urban areas and I'm not sure the reasoning behind it and maples for whatever reason seem to be the most susceptible. The thing that is curious to me is that the Norway maples of old that were planted out there do not seem to have this problem, the newer ones do, but I don't know if the ones that had the problem are dead and gone or, and that's just what's left over or that's the real one. So it is a definite problem particularly on, on maples. I showed up at this landscape in my early in my life and the guy was out there with a pickaxe digging the hole and uh, my first thought is, boy, this isn't going to work. And uh, so what we did was we dug the hole two inches deep, which made pickaxing a lot easier, put the ball in a two-inch hole depth, and then we brought soil and filled it up over the top of them and raised, made a raised berm. I tried to avoid creating whales and walruses and stuff out there in the landscape. I like a six or eight inch berm though if we got bad soil because plants seem to do quite well in that. The trees to the right, those two out there were planted at the same time and you can see that they're considerably shorter than the ones planted on the left. And to this day those trees are still there and it's been 30 years uh, since we put them in. So they've done very, very well in a raised bed. So if you got compaction, one of the ways to avoid that compaction is to bring up a slightly raised bed. Another thing that this indicates, and we see this time and time again, if you're going to plant trees, there's this idea and the human idea that trees got to be 40 feet apart in order to do well. Well, if you go to the woods, uh, two of the biggest uh, tulip trees I ever saw in my life were down in the Appalachia, and they were exactly, a, you could barely get your hand between them, and they were 12 feet across. So obviously they'd been stunted in some form or fashion, and they were 120 feet tall. So... We can actually plant trees very close. They work it out, and some arborists will come and tell me, well, you know, that's going to be a problem. And they said, you know, I'm, I'm 60 years old or 65 years old. It's going to be somebody else's problem. <laughs> so, and I, and, and I have and actually have a chinkapin oak in my front walk that has three chinkapin oak trees in the same hole. And they're right now 60 feet tall, and they seem to be doing just fine. So... They, uh, it is interesting, we know the roots are grafted on them, but the tops still act as sub different units of trees. So some years one tree will have acorns, another one won't, and then vice versa. But you can plant trees as close together as you want, or as far apart as you want. I prefer closer because I'm selling trees, therefore you get more trees sold. <laughs> but bottom line is, it is not a problem in, in, the, in, the, in the idea of what people perceive to be an issue. And the other thing is, who the hell's got 40 years to wait for the tree to get up there? If you put them closer together, you get a more instant effect. The other way we've had to do this, we've had to, had to go out on some sites. I do do some landscaping. I try to keep it at a minimum just because it's a pain in the butt. Uh, but when occasionally I do a, a job, I come out, I have to take one of these, uh, that's a... Uh, a uh, piece of steel, um, it's a shank that we drive into the ground about 18 inches and we will fracture the soil left and right uh, and across and then we will plant. And the difference between doing this on compacted soil and not doing this, the difference between success and failure. We'll also come in and we'll put sulfur down and we'll also put down some uh, N, P and K at a 3, 1, 2 ratio lightly to help those trees get better assault, uh, established. The sulfur, on a lot of these sites where we have berms and stuff where you have the high pH, that sulfur drives the pH down for a number of years and gets that tree uh, established. But if you don't do this on compacted berms, time and time again we'll see plants just die out because the compaction is so, so bad. Compaction is probably the number one killer of trees besides our 
some of the other practices we have, such as the nursery industry and not good roots and the like. But compaction, once it gets to the landscape and the plant is in excellent shape, compaction is a deadly killer. Some places, the only difference between that soil and brick is the color. So that gives you an idea how thick or dense that soil can be in our, in our landscape. Remember that we'd like to try to produce roots. This is an objective that I would like to have. Uh, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting closer all the time. It's sort of fun. It's sort of some of those things out there uh, that you, you want to accomplish and hope to accomplish, and this is where I'd like to see my plants and the roots that I'd like to see on them. One last thing before I let you go on this is there's this idea of sustainability, and I always keep hearing sustainability in the sense, and it's really about sustainability of the human race. I'm not sure that the earth is in that picture because the earth will probably sustain itself once we're gone. But one of the things that I've always laughed and got a big charge out of is that we continue to say that cultivars are better than straight species. And you have to look at it with a jaundice eye. A number of cultivars are good. There's a whole bunch more that aren't worth a damn. And then you got to sit down and think about, well, what are you really trying to accomplish here? And one of the things is that's Annabelle hydrangea, and this is the straight species, Annabelle hydrangea. This is Annabelle arborescence, the straight species, and that's Annabelle or hydrangea arborescence, Annabelle. And I had my staff go out every day uh, when they were in flower, they were right next to each other, and mark the number of insects we saw pollinating. Well, guess what? Annabelle has nobody show up for the party. There's no pollen, there's no nothing. And you know what? Insects aren't stupid. On the other hand, it was literally an orgy on these uh, Annabelle arborescents. There were 12, 10 to 12 insects. It's sometimes sort of hard to identify these things. And when I take them to the guys then who are supposed to know them, they throw up their hands too. But there were anyways 10 to 12 uh, pollinators. The bees literally ran across these things, crisscrossed them. And it was, they looked like they were so weighted down, I didn't know how they could fly. Also, we had four butterflies show up that pollinated also in this group. And on top of that, at night, I was out finally, uh, got to see them at night, and we had a, a, a moth. I, I didn't check it all night long, but we had a moth also as a pollinator. So and this one on the right produces a lot of pollen for an awful lot of insects. And when we talk about sustainability and diversity, we need those insects. We need those insects far more than we realize. The one on the left, we had one little idiot that would fly out of here, go into there, participate about a five second thing and then take off again and come back to the pollen. So when you look at cultivars, you gotta sometimes think what are we creating? And what are we trying to really do? And are they really better? So I got time for questions.